This closing bell, we're going to focus on the big global event that will take place later this evening. The U.S. Federal Reserve will conclude its two-day policy meet today. That's not the big global event. This is the central bank is expected to announce the end of its latest round of bond buys. That's QE3. With the end of the Fed's asset purchase program, investors will now focus on the Fed's tone on interest rates. Joining us for some impact analysis, actually expectation and then impact analysis, Christopher Palmer of Henderson Global Investors uh, on the line from London. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us this will be what the first time in three years uh, starting here onwards that the Fed will no longer be buying bonds as part of its quantitative easing program uh, but the sense is that the bond markets at least in the US have priced this in a long time ago yeah it may be the first time that the Fed's uh, not going to be buying bonds or at least announcing a schedule for not buying bonds but it's not the first time that they've talked about it and that's uh, really the key, you know, to guiding investor expectation is that they've been talking this up for the better part of 18 months and uh, uh, finally getting around to it now. Um, they'll balance that message, of course, by talking about the very low rate of inflation and the realistic possibility of deflation uh, in certain parts of the U.S. economy. So you'd expect today's event to be a non-event in a sense because uh, this is something that markets have been expecting they've priced it in and as long as there is no change in language with regards to when interest rates might start moving up uh, you know in fact this might turn out to be a big non-event or do you think there is the slightest chance uh, that like some Fed officials like James Bullard the Fed might even consider continuing with this last leg of $10 billion of bond purchases uh, till they feel a little bit more comfortable about the economic revival? I'm not sure. Uh, I certainly agree that uh, after having spoken about um, the, the end of the bond purchase program that they, they ought to now start moving in order to maintain their credibility. It's important for them to uh, at certain times act on uh, things that they've spoken about. Um, perhaps the Fed will give the markets more confidence by talking about some of the other measures that they can use to um, maintain liquidity uh, without the direct uh, purchasing of bonds. So you may see a shift uh, in language towards other instruments as well, which I think the markets uh, would be quite interested in. But do you think the, glo the, the global economy is ready for this? Uh, I think that the global economy is ready for uh, new approaches given that the consensus has certainly started to move towards uh, one where the liquidity injected by bond purchases is arguably not having much of an impact uh, or incremental impact in the U.S. as it had uh, in the start of the program. The banks are in better shape, for example, so certainly the U.S. banking system is in better position to weather the end of uh, the bond purchase program uh, and Main Street uh, and we know that Janet Yellen cares deeply about Main Street probably is looking for some other measures uh, which will make that liquidity uh, have more in, of an impact at the level of small businesses and the consumer so um, we may see a shift in the message in that direction and I think in terms of the US financial institutions they are ready for this uh, I think what's happened in the last few weeks is that, of course, Europe is not ready for this, and that's, uh, that's part of their balancing act. Uh, Chris, I want to come back and talk to you about other measures that you pointed out. Uh, but before that, uh, we'd also like to welcome Arnab Das of Trusted Sources to this conversation. Arnab, a very quick first response on whether you think uh, you expect the Fed to say anything out of the ordinary uh, today that could be a market-moving situation. Um, well, I think that's the key. I think, as your um, earlier guest was was suggesting, the um, end of the of, of QE, the completion of tapering, is uh, well discussed and well priced, and it would take a a really very severe shock uh, to change that prospect at this stage. Um, what's going to be the main focus, I think, is whether the language changes materially or not. Um, and the um, the Bullard statement. Um, which is a little bit offset by the, the, the Boston Fed Rosengren, uh, President Rosengren statement in the other direction, um, is, is essentially a response to the volatility that um, was engendered in the market around the time of the IMF meetings, where the markets all of a sudden started to realize that um, the Eurozone um, in particular, but also Japan, um, are having 
uh, great difficulty restoring growth and inflation to target. And even the United States, which is doing well, uh, at least in terms of growth and um, reasonably well in the labor market, is experiencing uh, a low and falling inflation rate as well, um, thanks to a strong dollar in part and also thanks to um, the, the not-so-great state in the end of the labor market, right? So those are reasons why the Fed may be more judicious, um, more considered delayed, uh, and perhaps slower to raise interest rates um, than it might otherwise have been if the U.S. recovery were more robust. Fair enough. I, I know, I'm just going to interrupt you there because our colleagues in the U.S. Uh, you know, did their regular poll uh, right ahead of the FOMC meeting uh, only to find out that most market participants expect now a rate hike only in July of next year. So we've seen a lot of volatility in that expectation, right? It used to be third and fourth quarter. It moved up the second quarter uh, a little earlier this year, and now it's gone back to uh, July in that sense. Would you say thereabouts is when you're expecting rates to start moving up in the U.S. as well, July 2015? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to call precisely when um, the first rate cut will come. Um, and, and as you say, that expectation, the consensus around that has been moving around, and we've moved around our expectation a little bit by a few months here or there. I think that's important in and of itself um, for the shape and the level of the front end of the yield curve and for currencies and, and, and so on. But I, and, and I don't mean to minimize the importance of that for anyone. However, I think if we take a step back and think about what's really going on here, um, the underlying reality is that the U.S. recovery is robust compared to the recoveries in other high-income countries. But it is not robust compared to previous U.S. recoveries. Put it this way, how many years have we seen that the, um, that the year opens with consensus forecasts for U.S. growth being on the order of um, at least three, if not three and a half percent? And as the year unfolds, for one shock reason or another, domestic or external, those growth expectations, um, inflation expectations, end up being revised downward, right? How many times are we going to go through this process before we acknowledge that the U.S. isn't actually returning to trend 3.5% growth and that indeed potential growth, whether or not there's secular stagnation, potential growth may have um, suffered as a result of the financial crisis. And so if that's the case, then the bottom line is the Fed may move a little bit later, a little bit sooner, but it's not going to move very aggressively. Mm -hmm. It's going to move relatively slowly and not move up to a very significant level of the Fed funds rate because the U.S. economy isn't doing that well and um, compared to its own history. And if you have a significant policy divergence between the U.S. Um, and the Eurozone and Japan in particular, you're likely to have a much stronger surge in the dollar, which will import more disinflation into the economy. And I think that's very important because the Fed, for really the first time in living memory, has made note in the minutes um, of the strong dollar and of global economic conditions rebounding back into the U.S., all right, that's a fair point. I, I want to bring in Chris here because he did mention that he thought that in an effort to help the recovery along, the Fed might resort to other instruments or measures. And Chris, if you could elaborate on what you think that might be, are you referring to something like the ECB's LTRO? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm not sure whether they would uh, mirror what the ECB has done, but, you know, certainly one of the big concerns with um, with the bond purchase program and some of the liquidity measures that the Fed's been using over the past couple of years is that a lot of that money doesn't get recirculated. Uh, it simply goes back uh, into the Fed hmm. um, in the overnight market and through other mechanisms. And I think, you know, what they're going to be thinking about is how can those uh, capital, can those liquidity injections uh, – you know, be put to work at the banks better, either through more active measures around reserve requirements or reserve interest rates at the banks. I mean, they've been thinking about those ideas for a couple of years now. Um, so we we may see some uh, some efforts in that regard. But I think, first of all, what they've got to do is 
maintain their credibility by putting their money where their mouth is. They've been talking about taper for a while and stopping the bond purchase program. I think they need to show some movements in that direction. Uh, also remember that this is a Fed that historically, uh, at least uh, through Bernanke's uh, chairmanship, is also quite happy to observe market interest rates and forward curves and say, hey, what's the market telling us? where uh, interest rates should be. And really one of the things that they've struggled with over the last couple of years is that um, interest rates in the marketplace uh, from for very long periods of time have been nowhere near what the Fed's target rates have been. They've been lower. Um, and that's really telling us something uh, about um, where rates should be. And yes, if you look out far enough and you look into the forward curves out to July and beyond, yeah, you do see the pos possibility that the market uh, is thinking about a rate hike, but you know, as we move forward along that curve in time, uh, those kind those kind of rate hikes that the market's pricing in evaporate. So they're not getting strong enough signals from the market either about about the possibility of hikes. And I think the Fed then is is a bit, you know, they would be uh, they'd be quite happy to let the market dictate uh, in the forward markets and looking at cur at the forward curves and and market prices to see where. Uh, the market thinks rates should be as well, and that's very much a legacy of what Bernanke was all about. I mean, it can mean that the Fed is behind the curve, but in this regard, I think they're happy to be behind the curve because their ultimate objective is to get some growth going in the U.S. economy. All right, gentlemen, our final question then to both of you, and, uh, you know, I think that's very narrowly from the India perspective. What will all of this mean, uh, either in terms of rate movement or currency movements that are pointed to the dollar for emerging markets like India? Chris, uh, do you believe that if the Fed doesn't change language today, does end its quantitative easing program and reaffirms the consensus estimate of a rate hike, let's say July onwards next year, that there will be any negative impact on India between now and then? I can't imagine there'll be any negative in impact on India from anything the Fed does in the next six months. I, I really think that what India uh, it needs to do is, is show that, uh, and we've heard and seen uh, estimates that inflation could fall quite rapidly in India um, and really start to see a dividend from the lower oil price. I think that that's a much larger factor for what's going to impact India in the next six months. So let's see how much of that uh, lower energy bill India can capture and put to work in its domestic economy. Adam, how do you see what the Fed does or doesn't do impacting global fund flows and therefore emerging markets like India? Um, yeah, I think I, I tend to broadly agree. Um, the, the global environment has become uh, much more accommodating for India, um, certainly this year, this at this time this year than compared to the same time last year, right? So I think um, a lot of things are happening on the domestic front, which are quite positive, um, and the international front, um, as was just mentioned, falling commodity prices, energy prices in particular, India is a major importer of all kinds of hydrocarbons and other commodities, um, stands to benefit. Uh, I think not, not only is that an important kind of disinflation benefit at the headline level, at the PPI level, what have you, um, it's also a kind of autom contributes to an automatic um, rebalancing of the Indian economy, right? Because it implies that um, uh, the current account deficit, um, the, the trade deficit will be smaller than otherwise, also implies um, a lower subsidy bill. So there's a fiscal adjustment, plus the government has moved to liberalize um, and deregulate at least diesel prices. Hopefully there'll be more deregulation on that front, taking advantage of this kind of golden window of opportunity. Um, on, on the Fed itself, I think, um, you know, the, um, the, the trajectory that I think both of us are painting is, uh, is quite positive as well for India, which is that the Fed um, is gradually, smoothly finessing the exit from QE um, and is going to continue with the forward guidance that helps to manage the front end um, of the U.S. yield curve, um, you know, largely in line with the, uh, with the middle and the long end of the yield curve which are all telling us, even as the Fed exits from QE, that there isn't a major inflation problem in the United States uh, or in the wider world. If anything, the problem is one of disinflation. And in that environment of low global growth, low inflation, falling commodity prices, investors are going to be desperately seeking um, countries that offer some inflation, some prospect of accelerating potential and actual growth, and therefore some higher, um, higher returns. And I think India stands out um, in that regard um, in the emerging market space 
um, as a particularly attractive story. And, and I think people have been participating in that story already. What I think is very encouraging, especially for me, a longtime skeptic uh, about India, about my native country, um, is that people are not selling and taking profits to cover losses elsewhere in emerging markets. I think investors in the rest of the world really see positive signs coming out of India relative to other emerging markets and relative even to, even to China as the, as the largest emerging market and, of course, relative to the developed world. Well, that's reassuring to hear. Arnab, Chris, thank you very much for joining us on this debate. Uh, we'll be watching what the Fed does or doesn't do later this evening very closely.